Hi Year 11, it's Mrs Reed and welcome to our first recap session. So these are short sessions that just focus on specific areas that you might need to revise. This one is all about reading the extract, how to really use and maximise the reading time that you have in the exam to explore unseen texts. As with previous sessions, I recommend that you um, get rid of any distractions. You make sure you're organised before you start with a pen and a paper. And that you use the Cornell Notes method as a way to organise your notes. Ones that can be clearly used for revision and retrieval in future. And that you spend a short amount of time at the end of a session writing your summary to consolidate your understanding. So let's talk about paper one and paper two for a moment. Both of these um, exam papers include what we call unseen texts. So when we say something is unseen, um, that means that the first time that you read it will be in the exam. You will then have four questions on each paper to answer linked to that piece of reading. So the reading time that you have is really, um, it really is essential that you use it um, effectively to get the most amount, uh, sorry, the most out of that time. So 15 minutes reading time is what you have. Now actually, um, that can be a particularly, it feel like a particularly long time in the exam. We know that time is pressured, we're trying to do a lot very, very quickly. So actually spending a full 15 minutes reading for some students seems like a long time. However, I have seen uh, many times students who think that rushing through and reading the text once before getting on with the questions is the best method. And I really don't believe that this is the case. I think that using your 15 minutes to read the extract, perhaps more than once, using that time to read through the question paper and really get to know what it is that you're being asked to focus on and to um, uh, give a response to is important. I also firmly believe that annotating the text can be a really useful method to help structure your thinking as well as helping you to plan your answers before you begin writing. Okay, so let's start with the idea that we need to read the questions. In fact, a quick scan across the questions in the paper, there are only four of them, so it's really not going to take you very long to do this at all. By reading the questions first, it's going to provide you with a focus for the rest of your reading give you some areas that you know you will have to write about and help you to understand a little bit more about the characters before you begin. So when you're reading the questions, you might want to be thinking through the following things. Um, question one, for example, will specify certain lines. So what lines are you asked to look at? And what's the focus of that question? Are you asked to comment on a character's actions or um, the weather or the setting, for example. You might look at question two as well. What lines are they asking you to zoom in on? What is the focus of this question? We know it's a language question. How does the writer, for paper one, so therefore we can be looking ahead and thinking, well, I'm going to have to spot language features in this section. I can be aware of that straight away. If I talk again about paper one for a moment, well, question three will focus on the whole text. Well, that um, means that throughout the text as I'm reading, structural features um, are going to be something I need to comment on and be aware of. Shifts um, in the mood or the atmosphere, um, sudden changes, what happens and in what order, these things are important. But question four, that's a big mark question in both paper one and paper two. So I need to be thinking it here about, well, which lines, first of all, um, I'm going to be asked to look at. And then in paper one, what's the focus of the statement that we're given, that response that a student has said? 
Um, and that can really also help to guide our thinking about the text as we go through. We can be looking out for the evidence that supports the ideas in that statement. So making sure we're familiar with the questions first is a good strategy. And then I would always advocate marking up your text so that you can clearly see um, which sections of the text focus on which question. Now, question two in paper one, those that um, section of the text will be printed for you. However, uh, separately. However, question one, for example, you can mark out on your page, just pencil and ruler straight across the page. Um, this is the area that I've got to look at, for example, lines one to four, just in that first paragraph. And that's all I'm allowed to use for question one. It means I don't miss out on any marks. And equally, um, for question four, for example, marking that out in the text, where am I going to gain my evidence um, to formulate uh, my argument, whether I agree, disagree with this statement and why? And just having that visually laid out on the page can be very useful to you. When you do start reading the text, remember that little section, that box section at the top, what we might refer to really as a blurb, is a particularly useful area. It gives us the contextual information that we need to understand the extract, so we must pay attention to it. It will tell us things like the main character's name, um, where this um, story is, is set, um, and some further little details of information that are going to be useful to um, help our understanding. So we must not neglect looking at that top box. Okay, so I know in your lessons you will have done quite a few things in to help structure your thinking um, around reading. So I've just used this example from paper one. We've given you some questions to look at that will guide you through a, a fiction piece of text. So we'll be looking at like the order of events in the story, um, you know, what has changed from the beginning, middle and end. You might look at the narrator who is telling this story. Um, the setting where the action takes place as well as the characters and you'll be looking out for those features of language which images are particularly powerful um, is there anything in there that really stands out to us that we, we might want to, to be aware of before we uh, go on to answering the questions it might be that you identify a particular uh, repetition a pattern through the text or a use of symbolism So reading with a focus is my uh, bit of advice to you here, that we know the kinds of things that come up in paper one and paper two. We can be guided by the questions and therefore we're not just blindly kind of looking at the text and we've got no idea well, what we're going to say about it. In fact, there are things that should structure um, our, read, our focus of our reading. So, for example, being able to say summarize the events, what happens, being able to name the characters. Um, in doing so, make inferences and um, looking beyond literally what we're told to the more implicit meanings. We might have to identify the mood and atmosphere of the text and how that changes, as well as whether there are any big thematic ideas that run throughout. Similar things um, are there to look for in paper two. However, we know there are two texts and they are non-fiction texts. So our focus changes slightly. We need to be able to summarize the writer's opinions this time, to be able to look for uh, and identify feelings and how they may change. We're also going to have to compare the two texts. So looking at similarities and differences between the topics presented and the writer's viewpoints will be useful but there will be similarities. We're still wanting to infer. We're still needing to look at what the bigger um, ideas in the text are. Okay, on to annotating. So a word of caution here first. When I say annotating, um, I expect lots of students think straight away of highlighting and uh, a word of caution really around highlighting too much text. If we highlight great big chunks of text, um, really we're not prioritising any particular piece of information. 
it can also give us this uh, sense that we feel like we're doing something even if highlighting that information hasn't really been useful to us. So when we annotate, what that actually means is to add notes to the text, notes that give an explanation or a comment. So I'm advising here that if you're going to mark up the text, if you're going to highlight things, underline or circle, that you make sure you add some written annotations too, some notes that show why you've picked out this detail, what the connotations or the inferences are that you've made. Um, whether it's labelling a language, language feature, uh, labelling a structural feature, for example, can be a whole number of things that you do, but annotating um, is not just highlighting. Okay, an example here then. So I've marked up my text for question one, and I have marked up my text for question four. Okay, so I can clearly see these are the lines I'm going to look at, for example, question one, and here for question four. So that might be something that I label. It might be that I'm reading through this text and I'm, I'm going to talk about this really generally here, not specific to the text that's in front of me. Um, and I've, I've decided that there's a really useful piece of um, figurative language around here. Okay, so this section of the text I think is useful, I've highlighted it. It's not enough just to have highlighted, so I need, so I could label whether it's a language feature, I could put in my connotations, Okay, maybe over here there's something about a character. So I might want to write about the character. What I can infer about them. It might be that I just want to write a short paragraph summary, one sentence, even a couple of words. I could talk about the tone, the atmosphere, Okay, how things might have changed throughout the text. So when I'm marking it up, okay, things like boxes, all right, what can I tell here? Okay, well, um, this time I've said, I'm literally going to explain the order of events, what happens and when. Okay, I might be making some links between the opening of the text in the ending, perhaps there is there's a terrible arrow, um, a cyclical structure of some kind. So there are a number of things that I can pick out of the text when I'm reading, but annotating is important. Um, as I say, stressing that it's not just highlighting, but it is giving yourself uh, a, a list of words and useful phrases and things that you can then go on to use in your answers. Okay, so top tips for reading time. Well, first was to use that time effectively. Use the 15 minutes, use them thoroughly, read that text as many times as you need to, reread over paragraphs, make notes. So the caution is don't rush it. Don't rush through once I've read it and I want to move on. For reading questions, you need to be um, as thorough in your responses and clearly communicate to the examiner that you have read and understood the extract well. So read the questions, the blurb and the extract. That means that you are allowing yourself to have a focus as you read. Don't highlight big chunks of text. Single words, short phrases, Absolutely. But annotate as well, show your thinking. Write summaries for each paragraph to show what happens at what point. Don't read with no focus, just don't go in and just say, oh, I'm just going to read it once. I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'll just go for it. Be guided by the questions. Look for things like language features, structural features. Also be guided by question four in both papers. Use the statement to help identify what you're looking for. 
and practice too. Practice reading different extracts, fiction and non-fiction. Practice annotating texts. Practice using your 15 minutes to plan. Okay. Back to your Cornell notes. Make sure you go through there and write up your summary. And have a go at the reading practice task that you'll find on the Google site. Okay, thanks for listening.